Welcome to the podcast Unimagined, where current and former students share how they imagine education in schools could be regarding student leadership. We ask them to share about their experiences and offer advice on how we can all do better. In this interview, Addie Barker has been writing a local newsletter for almost a year now, and in doing so, she caught my eye. She's the same age as one of my children, and her ability to find a path to use her voice during a time when many students were lost as icons on a screen was really inspiring. Well, first of all, thank you for coming here and taking time out of your day to be with us and answer some questions. Usually we start off asking our guests a little bit about your strengths. Creativity, definitely, because I'm always like finding a new way to think or like literally being creative. I don't know if I'm the most curious person, but I guess just like always trying to find the answers to things. I ask a lot of questions. Most of the time, mostly, I just observe what other people do. Awesome. Thank you for going into detail with that. I feel like those are great. Reflecting on what you do and why you're here. Yeah, I was looking at the bio that you sent us, and I was curious to know when you moved from Oregon to New Hampshire, like what age were you, and what was that experience like for you moving Well, I don't really remember it all that well, but I was six years old, so I was pretty young. I just remember that, like, I had to move away from my friends, but I didn't really feel like I was really nervous. I don't remember being, like, super nervous because, I don't know, I felt kind of confident just moving to New Hampshire. On the first day of school, I might have felt a little nervous, but... I always found friends, so. So you say that you're confident uh, when you came to New Hampshire, and I think that's really a cool trait to have, especially as a kid. So how do you see that like confidence at a young age translate into what you're doing now with your sort of business ideas? I put in a lot of effort to what I do, and I would say I was kind of nervous to, like, start the whole thing, but it took a lot of confidence out of me to just, like, finally start up what I'm doing now. As a leader, I feel like, you know, you trust people that do seem confident and do seem like they know what they're doing or they want to learn about what they're doing more. That doesn't really come naturally. That's something that you have to work at. What are some tips you would give to kids who don't naturally have that confidence and that do kind of need to work at it, maybe something that you did or that you think about personally? Well, at school, I don't think I'm the most confident person, but I always try to like think that like I'm doing my best or like people don't always see you for who you really are. So like, it's not all about what people see in you. It's more about what you see in you. That's really cool that you said that. We touched a little bit on your business, but I would like for the audience to know a little bit about where the idea came from and how you got started specifically in writing your newsletter that is now the Neighborhood Newsletter. My friend had a typewriter when she was like 10 years old and I thought it was really cool and we really didn't do anything on it except like type gibberish but then one day we decided we wanted to write what we saw out of the window and then we kind of started the business and the newsletter and then I got my own typewriter and I was like hmm I kind of want to continue what we started so that's what I did. It's really fascinating that your newsletter started on a typewriter. Do you find that the typewriter is frustrating? Do you find that it's fun? What Can you talk about how the digital world and a typewriter drive what you're interested in? Well, I don't know. Like, a typewriter just seems pretty self-explanatory, where, like, I mean, a computer is obviously easier to use. A typewriter, it seems like you can just type on paper and then it will automatically, 
be like a hard copy where like on a computer you have to like print it out so I just think it's really cool how I can just have the hard copy right away and then I can go make copies of that copy and I just think I find that easier than using a computer. So you talked about just typing about what you saw outside of the window and I since Lorraine sent me some of the links or pictures of your material I'm curious where you get your inspiration for your material from. Each issue has like a certain theme so sometimes I get that theme from a sentence somebody spoke or like even shows I watch. Sometimes I have a holiday theme so there's always ideas that you can think of like I'm probably never gonna run out of ideas for the fat pig speaking of the fat pig can you tell us where that name came from in third grade I made a comic strip that I thought was really cool and it was basically just this like pig that was a very simple drawing and I called him fat pig because it was basically just a fat pig that is absolutely fantastic when did you get the typewriter I got it two years ago on Christmas. You know, it's funny, Addie, I have been getting your newsletter now for almost two months. I think I started in early February. The theme is at the top and then everything is sort of tied to it. I think one of my favorite stories that I read in one of your editions was how the traveling salesman for the vacuum came to your house and the experience that you had and wrote about in the newsletter. So can you tell the listeners a little bit about the traveling salesman experience? Basically, when I got home, there was this random guy in our house. With, he was like showing my mom these things because apparently we let him into our house. And my mom thought it was really funny also. So it was just a really strange thing to witness, I guess. And did he end up selling you the vacuum? Um, No, it was way too expensive. It was like $2,000. For a vacuum, that's crazy. So tell us a little bit about the start of like when you first started putting this paper out. Did you just kind of like hand it out? Did you use word of mouth? How did you get to where you are now with it? So when I started, I just made this little letter saying, do you want to buy this newspaper? And I told a little bit about the background. And then I made copies and we just gave it to everybody on my street. And then a few people said yes, but not everybody. There was only like three people in the beginning. And then my dad started posting pictures on his Instagram. And then everybody just seemed to want the fat pig. And you personally deliver most of the newsletters. Well, I used to mostly just deliver them. But now there's like a lot of people in the mail. I have like people in California, people in North Carolina. And I really appreciate how you have been able to utilize the the schedule of remote learning versus hybrid learning to to develop a a system for delivery and you're really good about letting your readers know if there's going to be a delay or if the day is going to change. So how many issues have you? I've made 32 issues. That's a lot. Yeah. Would you say that using the fat pig is like kind of using your voice in the neighborhood on like a higher level than just the surface of what it is? But I feel like without this, Would your presence in the neighborhood be very different? I used to not know many of my neighbors' names, and now I actually know, like, a lot more people in the neighborhood, so I do feel like it has made a difference. I really like how, in a time right now where news is driven by readership and viewership, so it's not necessarily just the the basic information and the facts. It's what is going to drive your audience. And I am curious, do you feel any pressure to write about things that are happening outside of the neighborhood? Or do you feel any pressure to write a story a certain way at this point? Well, sometimes I'm like, is this really interesting? Do people actually want to read this? I want to make this issue better than my last issue. So sometimes I am like a little bit, I kind of want this to be like an actually very interesting thing to read. And sometimes I feel like I don't do that as well. I don't know, like, I've never really done, like, a story 
outside of out of my neighborhood other than like weather. Do you get stressed or nervous when you're making the fat pig when you're writing it? Well sometimes I just feel like I really don't want to do it so there's like a lot of responsibility. When I got into this I was like oh it's just gonna be really easy and I'm gonna be able to just deliver and make a few bucks but now it's like a lot more than that. But I'd say that I also have a lot of fun making them sometimes, so it's kind of just a balance. I'm curious to know if you feel pressure to maintain the weekly delivery, or do you think you could pull back and do every other week? I've kind of always wanted to do every week. I don't know. I've been thinking about going every other week. Did the newsletter sort of develop during your time at home with COVID or did you have the idea prior to COVID? I think it kind of developed when I was in COVID because I was like, there's really nothing to do. So I actually really love that because uh, many of the guests that we have interviewed have said that it's been really hard to find their voice and to find opportunities for leadership during COVID I feel like this newsletter has given you a really great opportunity to get yourself out there and for people to hear you and know your voice, see your leadership. You have found a way to find the opportunities where others have found the opportunities don't exist. Yeah, thanks. How have adults in your life supported you through this journey of developing the newsletter? Every one of my customers and my parents, they all give me nice compliments about like what they think is good about the newsletter. And some of my customers even like tip me, which I think is really nice. I've just been having like a really positive community with my newsletter. I think it's really cool that you have the website. And I think that that's a great way to to mix the uh it's new technology with the old that you're doing here. Did you get any help when you were creating this website and figuring out ways to distribute and kind of work out the payments for all of this? Well, my dad does help me because he has like a Venmo account for people who live far away. One day I just really wanted to make a website and it wasn't actually for the fat pig, but that's how I discovered my website template thing. Then I was like, oh, I could use this for the fat pig, and I already knew how to use it, so I didn't really need any help for it. How about writing? Is this something that comes naturally to you, or do do you feel like an English teacher sort of inspired you to have this creative avenue to do this type of writing? Well, I've always really liked creative writing, but I know the newsletter isn't really creative writing. I just feel like when I'm writing something that like I just know what to say because I don't usually do a rough draft. Sometimes I do if I like need to research something. Usually I just go with the flow and I mean, I put words on paper, so it works out. What advice do you have for other students who are like, looking for a new creative avenue to express themselves get into what interests you and like not what you think don't try to like copy other people's ideas I mean you can always get inspiration from other people but you also want to kind of be original in your own way follow what what calls to you or whatever following that what advice would you have for adults either in school, out of school, um, community members, to support kids who want to pursue things like this? You always have to be encouraging, but also constructive. So you want to give people advice like that will help them. And if like they need to improve what they're doing, then obviously, you should say that, but like in a nicer way, I'd basically just say, do use constructive criticism, not just criticism. (laughs) Have you gotten some constructive criticisms or suggestions for your newsletter? My dad always gives me good advice for like suggestions, what I should do, things to improve the newsletter. And I've used a few of his suggestions so far. I think they're helpful. Something that I see a lot 
on social media and the computer world, uh, digital world, is commenting. Let's say posted one of these newsletters on a blog site, there would be the opportunity for people to put comments. Do you feel as though your clients have the opportunity to make comments or do you think that this is unique in the fact that that commenting aspect of the digital world is nice not to have for your newsletter? Well, I know that comments can be very negative on social media. My newsletter is kind of a little bit of both. Like the customers who get the fat pig only get it if they want to get it. So they'll only give me like positive comments and feedback. I think you said it very clearly in the beginning, and I think that that message is very important, that there is a lot of negative commenting on social media and the digital world. So it's nice that you get clients who want to purchase the newsletter, and that is sort of the feedback that you get. If people don't like it or they don't want it, then they won't buy it. And I think that that's fair enough feedback, and I appreciate your statement on that. How do you come up with the different ideas in the newsletter? Question one. And question two, what is your favorite section of your newsletter? For the ideas, I have like this little journal where if I ever think of an idea, it just kind of pops into my head. I write it down. So I have like this whole list of ideas and I just check them off when I use them. My favorite section to write is probably the theme section. And I also like writing the window report a lot. Can you talk a little bit about what the window report is? It's basically what it sounds like. I just look out my window and then it's like a report of things I see out there. So I just bring my little notebook and then like jot down all these things I see. It's actually my favorite section too. Have you always been like a natural leader on your sports teams? Um, I feel like especially for kids that had to move during, you know, their childhood, it's kind of hard to come in somewhere and kind of jump into a leadership role. Do you feel like that's something you had to work at or did it kind of come naturally? So I kind of got to know a few people and then I joined sports with those people that I knew and I became close friends with them. And I think sports have been a good opportunity for me to become a better leader, but also for me to be like one of the followers, like always listening to the other leaders on my team. Sometimes as someone who identifies as a woman or a girl, we kind of get nervous in a leadership position to come across as bossy because that kind of is a term that is used specifically with women in leadership roles. Do you ever get nervous in co-ed groups when you have to kind of take the reins as a leader that you're going to be perceived in sort of a negative way? Do you get nervous about that ever? I don't know. It's sometimes just around my friends. I kind of think I'm coming across as like too controlling or whatever. And sometimes at school, I also feel like that. But I don't, usually I don't really feel that way. I don't know if I am being bossy, but I guess, like, I don't really know. Do you see opportunities in school outside of sports where leadership can be obtained? Yes, actually in my math class, I really love my math class. I'm actually in advanced math, so I can be challenged a little bit further with my knowledge with math. And I feel like sometimes when I get to go up to the board, I I feel like I'm having fun teaching how to do the problem. And I think that's being a leader in my classroom. I think that a lot of times that's a good way to like learn the ropes of it. Do you have any aspirations for any specific careers in the future that you can see yourself doing? Um, I actually, I mean, I honestly don't know yet because I'm 13. I am very interested in math. I feel like since I got the chance to do advanced math, I've been more motivated with that subject. And also the teacher makes a big difference, obviously. I have also like being a writer. So you were talking about your teacher. 
motivates you because of the subject and the methods in which they instruct. Can you talk about some of the things that this teacher in particular has done to motivate you to want to learn? They make it more fun in class, so there's like these activities, but we also have to work really hard and we have to do math. Usually, sometimes it's like problem after problem, but I actually have fun doing the problems because sometimes when I get it wrong, I'm like, okay, I want to correct myself this time and try to get this one right. So I feel like that's good for me, at least. I know some kids in my class don't feel the same way. Absolutely. I think one of the most important skills as a leader is to understand that failure is part of the process. And just having you say that without any direction or guidance from us for you to identify that when you get something wrong it motivates you to figure out what's right or what how to do it right is really a valuable skill as a leader so i i appreciate you saying that thank you so much for being here definitely i thought it was so interesting in this interview to hear addie's observation about how negative comments on the internet can ruin the motivation of someone trying something new. I'm excited to see if the release of this podcast will bring her some new business. Thank you for listening to another episode of Unimagined. If this episode spoke to you, like it. If you think someone else could use it, share it. Or if you know of a student who has a story to tell, connect them to us. You can find me on Twitter at L. Connell 20. The theme music for this podcast was written and produced from a former colleague of mine, Keith McClendon, who is also an educator at a vocational school in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm.